Freedy, thank you. Um, at, a, at, a, at a TED forum out in California, I had the opportunity, I'm not going to mention who this was, but to talk to one of these superstar movie stars who attends TED and, you know, kind of floats. And we were hanging out in the bar, and she came in, and she said, Steve, I need to figure out what I'm about, what kind of philanthropy I'm going to support. And I've decided I either want to do human trafficking and women, or I want to do the oceans and environment. What should I pick? And I guess I was so caught off guard because it both seemed like an effort to be meaningful, but it also seemed incredibly vapid. Um, and so I'm interested in your world when you're advising folks like that. You're advising firms, you invite family, you know, do family foundations. If, how do you give that meaning and purpose that's real and not just slapstick? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we think a lot about philanthropy. At its core, philanthropy is about the heart. It's deeply personal, but increasingly, philanthropy is also about the head. That is to say, where are there funding gaps? So right. where does your dollar make incremental difference, and where does it make exponential difference? It's also more and more evidence-based. So what does the research say in terms of impact and outcome that can actually be achieved? And lastly, is your commitment enduring? Or is it one time? What kind of time horizon do you have in which to look for that particular outcome? So oftentimes, we're working with clients to help them articulate that and come up with a way in which to actually choose between those two, uh, those two causes that were articulated by your movie star friend. You know, one of the things, I've, I've done some reading of some of the things you've written recently, and particularly on diversity and equity and inclusion, um, and, and the notion that those can be as important as what a firm may do externally in terms of grants. And I, I guess I've always had this question. I guess it's the, you know, comes out of the Simpsons or something. You know, if, if you were a, just a nasty guy and you wanted to go and, you know, you had a horrible, you treated your workers horribly, but you had some, you know, big deal and you kind of went to the company and you had a, 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 a firm that had, you know, no bullying, no, uh, had diversity right, had these things. I guess I'm just sort of interested in why gravity just doesn't take care of the problem. Why doesn't this guy go out of business because of the business bottom line of a healthier environment just wins out? Why do we have to work so hard to get these issues right? Well, I mean, guy number one could have an unbelievable, he could have the killer app, or he or she could have the killer app, the killer product, the killer service, um, and that may outweigh uh, whatever their, their social issues are, and I think there's lots of, um, uh, lots of news around that. I think secondly, I'm not convinced we have the right metrics when we're looking at diversity. We, went, we tend to look at what we can see, but we don't tend to dig deeper in what diversity and inclusion means from a staying power perspective. Um, and I think largely the social sector, as many of you may know, has not agreed upon standard terms and definitions for what we believe is good and what we believe is bad, certainly not objectively. Much of it is subjective, and so we leave it, it to the... It's very fuzzy. That's right. We leave it to the, the sort of beholder to determine what is good and what is right. So how do you get more ruthlessly successful in the world of philanthropy? And, and what I mean by that, how do you get traction? Yeah. And, and, and there are a lot of people with sentiment, a lot of people with heart, a lot of people who want to do good things. How do you get their batting average up? So a lot of what we focus on is what we would call strategic philanthropy. How do philanthropists go beyond just making grants to making a difference? And I think there's increasingly an acknowledgement that there are tools that have to be uh, brought into the toolkit beyond just giving money. How do you use your voice to support the causes that you care about? How do you use your political capital to a certain extent to advocate for causes that are meaningful and important? How do you understand the policy environment and the policy levers that actually affect a particular cause? And then again, how do you objectively assess impact and at times walk away from philanthropic or charitable causes that you might think otherwise meaningful, but where a grantee organization actually has not delivered the results that they said that they would. And I think increasingly that is the sort of new generation of philanthropists that we're seeing who are not just writing checks, but they are asking the deeper question around is impact being achieved by what I hope to get out of it. You know, what I'm interested in, Richard Florida has written a new book called The New Urban Crisis in it, which he really talks about 
you know, two countries living under one roof, but very, very different impulses. And I noticed that your company, Arabella, has offices in New York, DC, Chicago, and San Francisco. So you're in these affluent, kind of like highly creative zones. But I have to tell you, I'm sort of worried about Montgomery, Alabama, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Dubuque, Iowa. Um, does gravity in the philanthropic sort of, you know, do good space operate differently when you think about purpose and mission in these places with creatives and wealth versus the areas where there's incredible social strain, there's ethnic strain. What do you, how do you compensate for one of these places that um, you would, I think some people would consider uh, under much, much more social and economic stress? Yeah, I think that this has really been called into question and has been sort of the existentialist di dilemma in the philanthropic community, certainly for the last 12 months, but, but longer than that. Mm -hmm. Huge mismatch in terms of philanthropic endeavors that are supported for the most part along the coasts here in the US and huge gaps um, in the middle. Uh, the traditional institutional donors, the Rockefellers, MacArthur's of this world, got their sort of um, ground initially by focusing on rural communities, and over the last 30 years have really reshifted their focus away from that. Um, and so I think you will see, I suspect, in the coming years, uh, greater and greater movement of philanthropic, uh, philanthropic capital into these areas, addressing a couple of things in particular. The first is um, the economic dislocation that has been caused by the concentration in wealth, not just across the coast, but in the sort of top zero one percent. And the second is, how do we rethink the um, jobs, skills, and work um, as the workforce and the workplace changes dramatically in the era of automation? I was interested, you know, in reading about the story of how you built your firm, and, and you had this line, I'm always interested when somebody admits to making mistakes, you said, we made many mistakes. What were the mistakes you made? Um, and to think about this question of getting, you know, purpose aligned with, you know, the direction the company's going. Well, I'll tell you one of the things that I think we did right, um, and then I'll get to the mistakes in a moment. Um, we are a for-profit enterprise. We're a benefit corporation in a world... This is what they call B Corp? We're a B Corp. Um, in a world that operates largely, these are nonprofit donors that give to nonprofit um, uh, uh, charities, um, and we're one of the few outliers in that space. Um, every single person advised us not to do that. There's mm. deep suspicion, I think, uh, between for-profit and nonprofit entities. We've heard a little bit about that today. But the idea that you can uh, sort of that purpose and profit are not mutually exclusive, that they come together as one, I think was incredibly important, particularly in hiring and attracting a mm. certain caliber of an individual who is motivated to think not just about meaning and purpose, but quite frankly, do it in an innovative and disruptive way. So that's what I would call as kind of a success. It was sort of uh, a lot of the advice we got in the beginning of the organization was don't go that route. It'll be sort of detrimental to the business. Um, in terms of mistakes, I think it was several. Um, the first mistake I think we made is that there is um, there is real value and benefit in bringing together a broad network of philanthropists. And the reality is, is there is still a bit of a bias towards going it alone for a lot of donors. It's taken a while for philanthropic endeavors to come together under collective purpose. Um, a second mistake I think we made is we weren't sufficiently ambitious. Um, we assumed this was a very small uh, community. Your um, guys are big. And community. the community is, is big and it's yeah. only getting bigger. Um, so we didn't build a firm to scale um, and that's something that we've been focused on over the last couple of years. I mentioned you've dealt with hundreds of clients. What is the biggest blind spot they have? Uh, several. Uh, the first is I think philanthropy is supposed to be the sector that takes risks. They don't have the same kind of scrutiny as the public or the private sector. But in our experience, most philanthropists tend to be quite hesitant um, as they approach their philanthropy and they start from a fairly risk averse position. Let's do something that's easy. Let's do something that's small. Um, and I think you're seeing a, a slightly different turn over the last couple of years with these large big bets, kind of hundred million dollar types of initiatives. But by and large, the majority of donors tend to start small and they tend to start at the places that are the easiest. The distinctive donors are the ones that tackle the harder 
worst problems and the ones that tend to go after the most underfunded areas. So I'll give you an example. There's a, uh, there's a philanthropic initiative called the Hope and Grace Fund. It's uh, uh, funded, it's incubated by Philosophy, which is a cosmetics company, and they decided that they were going to focus on destigmatizing uh, mental health for women in particular. Um, that's a tough issue. It's very nuanced. Um, there is a lot of stigma around it, and there's a lot of nuance in terms of building awareness around it. But they didn't shy away from the fact that it was hard or it was underfunded. In fact, that's what actually uh, made them commit to this particular initiative. You know, it, 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 in your own background, you, as I understand it, were born in India, raised in the Philippines, came to the United States, and so you've had a pathway that's different than for a lot of folks. Yeah. And I'm interested in how those experiences, when you look at the deficits of things that aren't happening in the world. I, was, I liked your answer at the beginning saying there's data that shows us where we've got gaps. Because part of what happens in philanthropy is you, you get philanthropy that kind of rushes to the easy, you know, feel good public subjects. I'm just interested in the stuff that just doesn't get done well. I mean, what, how would you, how does your experience inform what you're doing today? And where do you see the biggest gaps, the serious gaps uh, in, I, I don't want to call it philanthropy, but, but, but fixing problems that either firms with purpose or families with purpose or you know, social impact investing need to address that they're not addressing. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll share an experience. I think it's similar to one of the speakers um, earlier. Uh, I, I was born, I, I lived in India during the emergency with Indira Gandhi. I grew up in the Philippines under martial law with President Marcos and walked and sort of marched on the streets during the People Power Revolution. Wow. So it was never lost on me how um, you have to fight to, to sustain a democracy. And um, last year, like, like probably many, of all the data and statistics I looked at, I looked at the fact that 100 million people decided not to vote in the presidential election. 100 million Americans decided that it was either not worth their time, their energy, uh, perhaps it was too hard to actually do that. And so if you ask me sort of what one of the biggest gaps is, I broadly call it under the rubric of civic engagement. Um, and I think it spans the gamut of a lot of different issues. The first is how do you get um, young people who are our future to invest in and participate in the democracy that so many have uh, created. I think the second is how do you build up civic institutions at the local level, at the grassroots level, and how do you support them across a multitude of issues? And I don't believe this is, I, I, I'm concerned that in our society we've made this a partisan issue. I don't believe it's actually a partisan issue. I think it's a very standard issue. How do you uh, 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 enhance our education systems such that this becomes part and parcel of the core curriculum? And so I think that's one of the major gaps, um, certainly, that we're seeing. I think there's also a little bit of a blind spot um, I mentioned earlier. I think workforce training is an important area, but I think people tend to look at it pretty narrowly. We tend to say, how do you increase the efficiency of one worker? But I don't think we look at the system to say, what is causing massive economic dislocation? How do we use technology as a critical enabler to perhaps bridge those gaps between where jobs are and where people who need jobs are? Um, and lastly, how do we prepare our workforce for a world in which there won't be the kind of jobs 20 years from now that there are today. Let me ask you, you know, a tough question is, you know, you're, you're not only helping to, to, to solve this, I'm interested in, in and how you put meat and bones in a real problem. And one of the things that's emerged, and I, and I have to admit, I'm uh, perhaps admitting something here that's bad, but I'm surprised in a way and then not surprised by how pervasive sexual harassment has been. And so this is a new agenda item, right? It's out there, I mean, it's been out there for a long time, it's been embedded, there's a lot of demands uh, to do this. And I know so much of what you do is oriented around long-term performance, but you've got short-term need. And I'm interested in how, as, as a professional in this space, you might look at this as a real public problem that needs to be addressed broadly. What are the pieces of getting it right? So I think typically, it, it, you, you mentioned sort of sexism. Uh, I would say structural racism is probably another right. one of those issue areas where there is a real long tail to the issue. There are some short-term immediate needs. I think what I would say is typically we look at, um, you know, again, what are the advocacy organizations that are working in this space and have been speaking out on these issues? How do you fund, support, and lift them up? Secondly, what kind of research um, or evidence is needed to um, make these issues go from sort of social media to actually in 
infecting and affecting public policy? Um, and lastly, how do you find maybe non-traditional coalitions that can come together to bring these causes forward. So I'll give you a, an example from a different area, but we have seen increasingly the business community working with the faith-based community addressing local environmental issues. So these are communities that might not, or, or partners that might not otherwise come together, but for a particular issue that is affecting them. So I believe that there's a moment for non-traditional coalitions to come together, pool their philanthropic capital, Capital and drive impact and change in a meaningful way. I think the, the other thing to think about is philanthropy is one of those sectors, especially institutional donors, they have forever to solve a problem. And I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to wait forever to solve some of these problems? If we had to solve this problem in five years, how would we go about doing that? And I think that's a different question. It's not something that infects the halls of a lot of institutional foundations, but it's something that I would encourage us to all think about is if we had to solve this problem in a different way, do we need capital? Do we need more, uh, more people? How else do we need technology and something else that's quite disruptive? So I'd encourage that kind of thinking um, as people approach their philanthropic endeavors. Well, we are right at the end. I would have loved to have talked to you another half hour, but I want to thank you, Sampriti Ganguly, CEO of Arabella Advisors. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you.